Welcome, everyone, to the Coin Bureau podcast. My name is Guy, and my regular co-conspirator and co-host, Mad Mike, is away this week. But never fear, because I have someone to step into his oversized shoes. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce none other than the great Rob Wolf, uh, who is the front man of the wonderful Digital Asset News, one of my favorite YouTube channels, one of the best crypto YouTube channels out there. Um, uh, uh, Rob, it's a real pleasure to have you. Ah, uh, Guy, you are too kind. Thanks for having me again. It's um, yeah. Rob and I have uh, Rob and I have um, chatted on uh, live streams before, mm -hmm. and actually met in real life, which doesn't doesn't happen all that often uh, in the crypto space. But um, we uh, we met in real life when you when you very kindly uh, came and um, uh, spoke at the Coin Bureau event in London, which was. That was all the way back in May, wasn't it? Which I think it's safe to say yeah. feels like a lifetime ago. No, oh, it was it was the great time. It was well, it was end of April, early May, somewhere around there, 2021, and the market was just ripping. And everybody, there was there was exuberance, everybody was happy. And of course, now here we are in October 2022, and people are miserable. But that's okay, because this is the time when millionaires are made. It's it's time for all the tourists to leave and the real people that want to stick around to make some real wealth uh, to just hang around because it's going to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, yeah, this is this is one of the main reasons I wanted to get you on, Rob, because I think your perspective on all of this, you've got a very pragmatic outlook. You've got a no BS outlook. It's all delivered with uh, with a, a big, a generous helping of Texan charm. Uh, so I thought I thought this is <laughs> this is all stuff that our our listeners need to hear. Um, so I thought, should we just should we just dive on in and, and just kind of have a, a quick kind of talk about the about the markets in general? Well, in fact, no. Look, before we do that, Rob, can you can you tell us a bit about yourself, how you how you came to do what you do, your your background, all that sort of stuff? Sure. And before we start, I wish I wish it was later in the day because like this kind of feels like uh, two guys talking in the pub about biz. <laughs> Just talk and shop. I, love, I, I do love these ones. So, so my background is uh, prior military. I went in as a, it was a long time ago because I'm an old guy. I got grandkids now. And uh, I was what's called a 91 Bravo, which was back in those days, it was called a medic. So you run around, try to save people. Real fun times, right? And then uh, I didn't like being in the field. So they said, who wants to get out of the field? I said, sure, I'll do that. And they, I became a 91 Whiskey M6, which is uh, an LVN or a nurse. And then I didn't really, didn't really like that too much. Then I got out of the military and I went into uh, sales, medical device sales. And I worked at a company uh, called KCI, which is a, it's a, it's a wound vac company. People will get these, these huge massive wounds or massive injuries or whatever else. And uh, we'd put these, uh, essentially a medical grade sponge, close up the wound and heal people. It was great. Then I got into uh, management. I went and worked for a couple of different home health companies and uh, just kind of trotted around uh, the, the area in health in healthcare. But then I realized one day, I'm like, you know, if I keep trading my time for money, I'm never going to get ahead. It's just how it goes. And uh, I just started to, to dabble into a little uh, online education platform. And I created this website. It helped uh, nursing students pass their clinical exam. And that was the first time I realized that I didn't have to trade my time for money. People would come in there. They could learn some things. And they could pay me a fee. And then everything worked out. And then I got into uh, to real estate uh, with me and my wife. And that was an even better advantage because with real estate, what's great about that is that it's an appreciating asset. There's a lot of things you can do with it. And this is back in, gosh, 2010, 11. Yeah. And I don't know. I didn't know if Airbnb was around, but we did, we, you know, we did short-term rentals. Uh, we did long-term rentals. And now we do a lot more of the, of the short-term rentals with Airbnb with houses uh, here in El Paso and Houston and Puerto Rico, condos and apartments. And that was uh, a pretty good one uh, to be into. So we did all that. And then uh, also a nice little sports facility here for sand volleyball, sand soccer stuff. So a lot of different things that we do and Amazon business too, but that's, uh, that's pretty simple. But a lot of these things are starting to run on autopilot. And uh, I remember in 2017, actually, no, I'll take it back. In 2012, the son came home and he said, hey, I've got a great deal for you. And the deal is there's this uh, guy and he's, he's selling a, a hard drive with these things called Bitcoins. 
and he's going to sell 500 of those Bitcoins for $500. And I said, Alan, what is a Bitcoin? And he, you know, when he first explained what a Bitcoin is, and he's like, well, it's this thing, and it's decentralized. And I'm like, that, I'm going to stop right now. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's never going to make it. It sounds the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And of course, as time goes on, uh, I just, you know, missed out on a massive opportunity. And, and, but I will say this, and we'll get into this later, is that I didn't understand what Bitcoin was. So if I would have bought it for $500, two things would have happened. I would have lost that hard drive because this is back in 2012. Maybe it would have, I would have figured it out in 2013 when the big bull run happened. But plus, I would probably have sold it when it doubled because I, I didn't understand it back then. So I don't think I really missed out on the big opportunity. Fast forward later, 2017, all of a sudden we hear more about crypto and digital assets. That's when everything blew up. This was, I got in after you did, guy, because you got in way before I did, 2013, 2014, that area. But when I got in 2017, you know, this is a great opportunity, just like all the other businesses. And I thought I was a genius as everything went up and I wrote it all the way up and I wrote it all the way down. I bought Bitcoin at 3,500, 5,000, 10,000, 17,500. And then when it crashed in January and February, 2018, I was back down to where I was. And at that point, I said to myself, I got two options. I can take a huge loss and get the hell out of here. Or I can figure out some principles, maybe stick around for a bit, maybe dollar cost average, maybe figure out that timing the market is greater than timing the market, maybe understanding what the projects actually were and how they could change the world and just kind of move from there. And then from that point on, I just dollar cost average and I kept talking about it. My friends and family were like, don't tell us, we don't care. So I was like, okay, you don't care. I'll start a YouTube channel and just talk about it there because all the other businesses are just running on, on autopilot. So I might as well do something. And now here we are up to today, talking to the great guy from Coin Bureau. <laughs> How the mighty have fallen. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, listening to that, it, it's, I mean, it's such a, it's such a great story you've got. It's, it's also, it's, it, tell, it says so much about your character. You know, you're, you're, you sound like a really kind of pragmatic guy, the sort of guy who's kind of not afraid to take a step back, assess the situation kind of, I guess, dispassionately and, and, and think, hey, you know, what's, what's wrong with this picture? How can I fix this? Where do I go next? You know, you, you strike me as, as someone who's kind of constantly curious. Is that, is that fair to say? It's, 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 well, there's a couple things. First of all, there's curiosity. And, and the other thing that I've learned along the way, especially starting these different projects, is that I know that I'm going to fail. I failed way more than I've actually succeeded. So when I do these things, I, I step into it going, I know I'm going to screw up. I know there's going to be hardship, but it, just like in the military, if I just show up with the right uniform, things are going to work out. I'll get promoted, everything will work. And that's pretty much how it kind of comes down to. I, I look at the market, I go, I'm going to pick products that are going to lose. And I know that. And I think a lot of other investors know that too. And they go, okay, well, I know that if I invest in a 10, eight, seven, eight, nine might bomb. But the one that really makes it is the one that's going to gonna pull my A out of, out of everything and it's going to be okay. So if, if I can understand that I'm not perfect and I, and I will fail, that I think at the end of the day, I'll be all right. And that just leads me to the curiosity that you were talking about. If I'm not curious as to all my screw-ups and to all my successes and I can't just take a step back and say what works and what doesn't, then nothing will work. So I always say like... Uh, we have to learn from mistakes. They don't have to be your mistakes. So hopefully people can learn from our mistakes and move forward as better investors. Yeah. It's, and I think that's an attitude that's all too often kind of missing from, well, I think missing from the crypto space, certainly. And I guess kind of, you know, the, 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 wider, the, the wider world of investing, you know, it tends to be, it can have such a kind of macho feel to it sometimes, you know, and, and there's so much, there's so much hype gets built up, especially as you say, during, um, during bull markets when things are just going crazy and the, the, con the, the, the the picture becomes so unclear, doesn't it? And it looks like it looks like everyone's kind of making these huge wins and making these huge gains and no one seems to be failing. And yet people are sitting there at home and thinking, well, why am I why can't I do all of this? Why can't I? Yeah. And and without without really appreciating that, yeah, people are failing 
all the time, across the board, at, at everything, every day. But it's the people who, who learn from those mistakes who, and, and like you do, Rob, kind of accept those failures and, and move on. Oh, well, let me tell you, you want to talk about failures. So let's just, let's just stick with, with in, in the crypto space itself. I remember, I, so in 2020, when things were really, really heating up, I remember I put out a couple of price prediction videos. Ugh, never do those again. And I took a look at it and I said, you know, I think that Bitcoin, and I, and I thought it was a conservative number. I thought, I, I said, I think Bitcoin can make to 100K. At first, that didn't, that didn't work out. But then I thought, well, maybe it could make to 150K. And that was the most, the conservative. I, I always thought it would be between 100 and 150K. And we didn't even touch that. I mean, we hit, I think we topped out on November 14th to November 11th, somewhere around there, around 69K. And that was about it. Ethereum, I thought, could go up to, you know, 10K. Of course, we only did half that uh, and then some other ones. And then like when I take a look and I step back and go, look at all these, these, these failures that I've done. But it, it taught me some important lessons, which is as much as you think you know the market and where you think things are going, you're usually mistaken. So it's important to, and we'll, I think we're going to talk about this in a bit, is taking profits along the way. So you don't pull the same thing that I pulled, which was writing everything up and writing everything back down. I did that in 2018. In 2021, I didn't do it as bad, but I don't think I sold as much as I, as I should have and taken a little bit more conservative approach. And now, now here we are. And then also, like, uh, I mean, other mistakes. I mean, I've, this is why I, I have these, these new rules on my, or not new, these rules I've been talking about forever, but I've got really, you know, five rules. Uh, and it's because of the mistakes that I've learned from Voyager and Celsius, which is they became insolvent because they made bad management decisions. And if we can hedge ourselves against these bad management decisions that we don't know about, we'll be a lot safer. And one of those that I talk about is it's all gone, meaning don't invest more than you can afford to lose. I've, I've had people say that they've invested their total life savings and everything else into crypto. That is a recipe for disaster. And the next one is everything's a scam until proven otherwise. Next one is don't leave anything on exchanges. I mean, you can you can now, we're in a world now where we don't need a bank. We don't need an intermediary. We don't need those, those middle people. We can, we can custody our own assets in a, in a ledger or a tracer. So don't leave anything on exchanges. There's no point to it. And it, it's very simple to do. I mean, you've got great videos. I've got some videos too that would show you how to do it. Also, don't use leverage because it's, a, it's again, a recipe for disaster. There's, I think it was Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett who said uh, uh, there's three ways to, to lose everything. Uh, ladies, liquor, and leverage. And it makes a lot of sense. And then lastly, is take profits along the way. Sweet, sweet Jesus. I mean, if you could just take a look and, and just say to yourself, and we'll talk about this later, is about people will always say, you got a diamond hands everything and hold it forever. And you could, you could hold everything. Maybe Bitcoin becomes the new world reserve currency. I'm not here to, to dispute that. I have no idea. But maybe, just maybe, that won't happen. And if those things don't happen, Maybe it's a good idea to take profits along the way. So when the bear market comes, you have more powder on the sidelines to do the things you really want to do. Buy crypto, buy real estate, start a company, pay your bills for Pete's sakes and go from there. So those are the new rules. And, but it, it all came from all the screw ups that I did along the way. Yeah, I think, well, anyone listening to this, I think should just should just rewind those last few minutes and just <laughs> listen to those five rules, five rules again and note them down. Because, yeah, I mean, it's it's so true. It's so true. And yeah, from someone like you, from someone like yourself, Rob, who has who has made these mistakes, you know, this isn't just something this isn't just something, you know, you pick up in a self-help book. This is this is this is you've been there, you know, and, and I mean, I've I've made I've made these so many of these mistakes as well. And yeah, you know, the the best the only thing, you know, it's making a mistake twice. That's that that's the definition of a fool, isn't it? And um, yeah. if you mm. if you're prepared to learn from your mistakes, then then you know there's there's so many there's so many possibilities ahead of you but it's that fir it's that difficult first step step of of looking yourself in the eye and going i screwed up you know what can i how can i how can i not what steps can i take to not screw up again and i think yeah those those five steps of yours are 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 the best the best best advice you can give anyone well if you if wh whoever 
listens to the podcast or comes to the show, they'll see those five rules. They're constantly on my, on every live stream and every video that I do. So you can't forget them. And then, uh, there's a, there's a quote, it's a, it was a Greek philosopher, poet, Archipelagus. And they said, we don't, we don't rise to the occasion. We fall to the level of our training. And I think if you can have these, these rules, whatever those rules are that you create for yourself or, or maybe some of mine, I think it, it, it's, uh, it makes you a little bit safer in, in the investment realm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. So, so, I mean, let's, let's kind of be bearing all those, bearing all those things in mind. And, you know, as, as you say, you talk about Voyager and Celsius, these, these, these events that have taken place just within the last few months and the, in these really yeah. difficult last few months that the crypto markets had, that financial markets everywhere have had. So, yeah, I just, I'm really interested to kind of get your your take on on where crypto is at the moment, where the markets, where, what we're looking at, what sort of situation we're looking at. Obviously, we're we're deep into a bear market now. How long do you see it going on? You know, what, what do you think we're at a particular stage of the bear market yet? So, I'm a big believer in in cycles and and four year cycles and twenty year cycles and things like that. Um, there's a great book. It's uh, called, This Time is Different. It's by Reinhardt and Rogoff. And uh, it takes a look at eight centuries of, of economic folly and just says how things just kind of repeat and repeat and repeat. And for these four-year cycles, I mean, for, for Bitcoin has them uh, in, the, in the crypto market, I always take a look, you know, and it always starts with a, with a halving. So in 2012, we had a halving, 2013, an all-time high. Then 2014, we have a dip. In 2015, a reset. 2016, we have a halving. 2017, all-time high. 2018, a dip and a reset. Uh, in 2020, we had a halving. 2021, all-time high, which I didn't, th I honestly went against my better judgment. I thought, well, maybe we'll extend it out to 2022, but <laughs> it didn't work like that. 2021 was it. And then 2022, now here we are in this, in this massive uh, dip. I mean, I think we're down 71%, 72% from the all-time high for Bitcoin. Altcoins, of course, have fallen uh, somewhere specifically uh, different ones, 80% uh, or lower, depending on which one you take a look at. So I think when I take a look at where we're at right now, I just see it as we're in a bear market. And you have to understand that we were in a, in a very long uptrend from the time that Bitcoin was created in 2009, after the financial global crisis and, and meltdown, when we had an economic boom from 2010 all the way up to 2020, 2021. Yeah, I mean, I mean, take away that, that the coronavirus. And there was a lot of quantitative easing, a lot of printing, and a lot of globalization. And it was, it was right for that market to really happen. And we didn't see a recession. So now when people say, well, Bitcoin's never done, Bitcoin's never been through a major war. Oh, well, I mean, you know, it's been through Afghanistan. Afghanistan, we've been, been in there for, for decades. We just pulled out last year. And of course, the, 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 the Ukraine war. Now we're taking a look at sort of quantitative easing, quantitative tightening, which I believe what'll happen. And if we take a look at just the basic charts of how long recessions last, usually you're looking at around 18 months, maybe 24 months and going all the way back to the 60s. So if we hit a recession like we think we are going to in 2023, and not to say we can't have, a, have a, a rally in that time, I think in the next three months we might have a bear market rally. But if we have a, a recession 2023, which is the same thing as a four-year cycle, it goes down, which we'll see it. I think stocks, equities, uh, real estate will collapse. And then in 2024, we'll see a little bit of rebuilding, but pretty much sideways. And what does that leave us to? to 2025 when we start to hit bigger numbers and all-time highs. So it's almost, it's weird. It's almost like it fits in there perfectly. And having said that, does that mean it's going to happen? No, I could be wrong yet again. Don't, I have no crystal ball, <laughs> so don't listen to me. But it, it's almost like it's fitting in there pretty well, but maybe it takes to 2026 or 2027. And that, so the question that I have for, actually for you guys, would that be so awful if we got three years or so to dollar cost average and, and buy into our positions? Because like we know that bear markets don't last forever and neither do bull markets. So maybe that's yeah. another blessing we just don't know yet. 
Yeah, and it feels like after such a, I mean, there was talk of the everything bubble, wasn't there? After such a long period of of high prices, of growth, of quantitative easing, of all this, it, you know, it, yeah, as you say, these things these things can't possibly last forever, and there has to be there has to be a cooling off, there has to be a draining yes. of of all this kind of unnatural exuberance, and that has to happen before anything can grow again. So, I'm kind of with you. I mean, 2025 it seems it seems such a long way off, doesn't it? And there's there's so much there's so much kind of pain there's so much kind of you know there's so much bleeding of prices in that time and i guess i mean i don't know about you but certainly the the sense that i'm getting looking at the crypto market a lot of the time but also kind of wider markets as well i think the overriding sense can at times like this can often be just boredom you know everything's kind of trading kind of sideways and down any all that exuberance has gone and all you've got left are you know a kind of a few people sort of grimly hanging on in there uh whilst most people just kind of focus on on other things it's um so yeah i i don't i don't necessarily think a, a long cooling off a long period of 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 low growth is is necessarily a bad thing no no, and and then when I when I take a look at it, and I take a look at you know where these markets are are potentially going, I mean we could be we could go uh, any which way uh, in all honesty. But there's a couple of things that make me stop and consider I I could very well be wrong. There's two 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 ways to go about it. There is a, a legendary investor, Druckenmiller, and he came out and he said, like, look, he said, this reminds me of the same time uh, of back in the 60s and 70s. And if you take a look at the S&P 500, there was like a 10 years of stagnation and it went down and, and uh, it kind of went sideways and went up. But it took 10 years to really recover of what actually happened. And, and he, he gave some specific reasons. And the reasons why that it, it went down and came back up was, of course, uh, globalization. Things actually started to move out. These big corporations would, would, would move across globally and, and hire workers for, for cheaper labor, and they would increase their productivity. And right now, there's less of globalization as people, as especially here in America, we're starting to kind of pull things back and become more uh, uh, nationalization of what we want to do. And there's that. There's the, there's the Fed rate hikes which, I mean, we just did 75 basis points. Uh, mortgage, housing mortgage costs are like 7% or higher. And, I, and Jerome Powell said pretty much, hey, we're going to keep going until we break the back of inflation, which is 2%, even though we just see that it's, it's well over, uh, gosh, 6% now as well. So I take a look at that and go, maybe we've got a longer time than I think about. But then on the flip side, I also think about this. Institutions are greedy. Let's be honest. And if they're looking at some asymmetrical bets, they have to take a look at, well, okay, where is the future going? You know, from the uh, industrial revolution to the computer revolution to where we are right now, maybe the crypto digital asset revolution. Where is the money going? Right now, we're sitting around $950 billion market cap for the entire crypto market. Well, the entire market cap of gold is $12 trillion. The entire market cap of real estate globally is over $340 trillion. And the entire market cap of the entire stock market is between 260 and $300 trillion. So if they take a look at that and go, okay, where's the best place I can park my money as it inflates away? Well, maybe it's this thing called Bitcoin, crypto digital assets, because I want to see it double, triple. And all I got to do is just wait for it to go to 950 billion to two and three trillion? Well, they've already done that in 2021. So that's the thing that I always look at and go, is Druckenmiller right where we got a whole decade? Or do we just take a look at the money and go, okay, well, there's a bigger upside here and that's a big asymmetrical bet. Yeah. Yeah, and the sense I think the, the sense that there are institutions, there is there is big institutional money kind of waiting on the sidelines. I think, and obviously a lot of it it concerns. Well, I mean the actions of the Fed. That's something I wanted to to, to talk to you about ah, a little yeah. bit because I I, re I was really keen to get your perspective. I, I was talking to um, uh, to Ben Cowan about this just yesterday. I'm really keen to get you know the perspectives of of my American friends because, well, let's let's quickly talk about the Fed because. 
obviously you referenced, you talked about Jerome Powell, these this 75 basis point rate hike um, that they've just, that the Fed has just uh, put in place. I mean, it looks like we're gonna you're gonna get another one uh, in early November um, when the next when the Fed sort of reconvenes again. Do do you think that the Fed is? Do you think that the Fed is kind of is focused on its kind of credibility at the moment? Because obviously they kind of got burned um, around the pandemic, didn't they? When um, when they this these kind of claims that inflation was transitory, and now inflation is running red hot, and they've got to get it under control. So do you think? Do you think the Fed is is desperately trying to kind of maintain a bit of credibility now, which which would obviously mean that interest rates are going to keep going up for really the foreseeable future? I think I I'm just going to guess. I mean, I know Jerome watches the show, but I mean, I, I've never talked to him personally, and and I I just have to guess that I mean they kind of have a black eye because they talked about you know uh, inflation is not a big issue, inflation is transitory. Okay, now it's going to be around, but we're going to have a soft landing. Okay, now it's not so much a soft landing. Now it's going to be a harder landing, and now it's just going to be, you know, maybe just a, a big delta disaster as it just crashes in. So I think there is a part of that where they want to, they probably want to not just their reputation, but it's it's something. And guy, you know this. You you always want to do the best thing that you can do at your job. You want always want to. You know, try to live up to the expectations. Try to do the best that you possibly can. I don't think that Jerome Powell wants to be remembered uh, as the Fed chair like Burns was in the late '70s, because Burns was, was was the Fed chair before Volcker came in, and he got replaced because he did do Fed rate hikes, but he didn't do enough, which was really leading us into another Great Depression. And they had to get they said you have to step down. Volcker came in and said, "Look, here's what we're going to do. It's going to suck. It's going to be painful." but we're going to avoid this depression. And he did it and people were mad at him. But I know in the back of your mind, you're thinking to yourself, this is what I need to do to do my job and to make sure I do things right. And I think it's, and you can hear it in his voice in every one of his, of his speeches. I mean, just the, the Jackson Hole speech, he invoked Volcker at least four or five times and said, look, uh, we're going to keep doing it until the job is done. We're going we're gonna to try to hit that 2% rate. And we're going to unfortunately have to keep raising rates. It's going to be painful for the, the American worker, but we must do this because if we don't, it leads to da 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 uh, And then off we go. So I think that, yes, he's probably worried about like, you know, to, to saving face. But I think the bigger thing is moving forward into, you know, what is your, what is your legacy moving forward? Were you the one that led America to the depression or were you the one that let him out? Yeah. Yeah, and I guess be you know you want to he'll want to be remembered as 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 the guy who kind of forced forced the American economy to to take its medicine, however you know however difficult, however <laughs> painful that was. Um, yeah. Because yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, legacy I think is 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 top of mind for for guys like this. You don't want you want to be the Volker. You don't want to be the Burns. Yeah, and you know what? Like like here's a, a couple of things. First of all, who remembers Burns? Nobody remembers Burns. You know, they remember Volcker though. Like, oh, I remember Volcker yeah. because he's the one that did it. But having said all that, there's another side of that. Is this the perfect way to do things? Is this the right way for that Jerome has to do it this way? The whole Fed has to do this way? That's a difficult decision. That's a difficult things to say. And a lot of people will say, no, he can actually ease up and he can do these things. I personally think that he has to keep his foot on the gas a little bit because if we start quantitative easing, which Let's be honest, Bank of England's doing that right now. We'll see how it turns out. I mean, it's kind of weird to, to raise rates, but then also start to turn on the money printer. Maybe that's the way, but I just don't see it. Yeah. It's, and it's an odd situation we've got in the UK at the moment because obviously, yeah, with the pound, the pound absolutely plunged on, on the news of that kind of disastrous budget. And I mean, it's scary how close to parity with the dollar we got. I mean, it's, it's the, the craziest thing. But, yeah. you know, now that the bank has now that the bank has stepped in, the markets are are, are rallying. And actually, um, I mean, the, the, the UK See? government has yeah. been kind of forced into, <laughs> into a very embarrassing U-turn to, to kind of scrap this this top rate, this this top rate tax cut. But um, I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. certainly the, the pound is the pound is rallying now. But I mean, yeah, long term, you think, how can this 
how can just flooding the economy with more money how can that be how can that be a good thing in the long term this i don't know this feels to me like a very sort of a kind of relief rally before before things start trending downwards again certainly uh, certainly in 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 the uk market yeah that's a good point a lot of people i mean it's amazing like you'll see like there's two camps one that say this is going to lead to absolute disaster and other people are like no mon- modern monetary theory we can keep printing as long as we want to and it'll be fine and so we're going to find out we are going to find out and it's going to be a scary time that's why like like people listening to this hedge your bet you know i don't think this is the time to sell your your house and kids and kidneys just to start to put up into a bunch of stocks or crypto i think <laughs> I think there's a lot of unknowns, so be careful out there. Yeah, yeah, and that um, well, that kind of leads me into something because um, I wanted to talk to you about it as well, Rob, because um, we were sp- we were speaking off air, and you were talking about mm-hmm. you were talking about kind of this this idea of diamond hands. You know, th- this phrase that you oh, yeah. the phrase that we hear a lot in in the crypto space. This idea of you know holding on at all costs. You never sell. You yeah. never sell, never and. Sell. Never sell, and you know this is something that's it's it's a really kind of pervasive, um, you know, pervasive uh, thing in the crypto space at the moment. I've I've I must say, you know, I, I've I've kind of pushed this philosophy in the past as well because sure. you know I have I I believe it a lot of the time. But you made this really good point of like you know people are so often kind of led down this path of believing one thing or on and there's a complete opposite to that as well isn't there there are hype there are the hype merchants who are just you know buy sell trade you know do what do what you got to do and then you got the other you know the the hardcore diamond handers on the other hand, on the other side so i wanted to yeah i, I think this this idea of of how you should I feel as an investor you should you should look to go your own way you know the, the, the filter out some of this noise filter out filter out the diamond handers filter out the hype merchants and kind of focus on your particular path I mean is that something is that something that you've kind of always is that have you always tried to be your own man do you think or is this something that you've you've kind of developed over time no, it just, it just, it goes back to the same thing we were talking about, about screw ups in the beginning and the mistakes. Like in the beginning, I was just, you know, me and you guy are the same. We would say, you got a diamond hands. You got to hold for, you got to hold and hold and hold and then hold some more because that's just how everything will work out and it'll, it'll work itself out. Again, there's, uh, <laughs> there's this phrase I, I say, cause people will say, well, you know, bull runs don't last forever. Nothing goes up forever. Nothing goes down forever. So if you just hold, you'd be okay. But I want everybody to remember this. Some things aren't coming back as far as like crypto and digital assets. They're just not. And I always use an example and, and it may play out differently, but I always say uh, a dash assault. And there was two different projects. One was called dash and it was the biggest one of the, it was the top 10 crypto in 2017. And it was supposed to be the next big thing and uh, the flipping and take over Ethereum. And uh, if you invest in 2017, uh, you are underwater big time. Cause even 2021 had a little rally, but not too much. And the one on the one called salt, Salt was a lending platform and the SEC got involved and sued him. And in 2017, I think it went above a dollar. Now it's pennies in the dollar and it's not coming back. It almost looks like it, it almost looks like, like an EKG rhythm when someone flat lines and has a heart attack. That's essentially what it looks like. It's like one bip and that's it. So when we take a look at these things, you have to understand that the, some things are coming back. And in this bear market, that's when you want to what we call build a bear, do your research and all those things. So, the next part is understanding what kind of a trader you are, what kind of person you are, what kind of investor you are. If you are a Michael Saylor and you're a billionaire with a company that can uh, take out a bunch of debt and buy Bitcoin and wait for 50 years, that is much different from a person who works at the post office or is, uh, works at the post office, maybe single mom, has three kids and has very little time to invest and very little money and has to put food on the table. There is a vast difference. So you have to understand who am I and how long is my time horizon? If you want to diamond hands for 50 years, Bitcoin might be the, the, the greatest thing of all time. I'm not saying it, it can't. It may be the next world reserve currency. I have no idea. But I will say this. It is a, everything in crypto and digital assets is a speculative asset until we start to get some really fast mass adoption where people are using it on a day-to-day like basis. And I'm not talking about like a million people or 10 million people. I'm talking like 
a uh, hundred million up to a billion people. Once we get that, we're not a speculative asset anymore. Then all of a sudden things start to start to smooth out and we have more of those like typical bear and bull runs like we see in, in the stock market. So right now, if people say diamond hands, you can do that. I'm not here to say that you can't do that, but understand like how long is your time horizon? Do you have problems like buying things and putting food on the table? And if, and if you lose it too much, then that's it. Or are you like a billionaire who like, let it ride. I don't care. I got a billion dollar company. I can do those things. So yeah, it's just, it comes down to you and what you want to do. And that's why I say uh, nobody ever went broke taking profits. Take a little profits on along the way. You'll be all right. Yeah. And I think that's such that's so relevant now when, you know, as you as you alluded to earlier, you know, mortgages are going up, but just co the cost of living everywhere is, is going up. You know, there are bills to be paid and they're getting harder and harder to pay. And, yeah, I think it's so important to, to consider, you know, your own individual circumstances. It's like, yes, it would be great if you could hold on to this, to, you know, to your Bitcoin, to your, you know, to your Ethereum, to your stocks or whatever. It would be great if you could hold on to that until you know prices go up again but if if you've got to pay a bill if you've got to make your mortgage payment then you know perhaps perhaps now is the time to sell if 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 there's no other way to make that payment yeah and not only that but think about this way like how many people have been diamond handing for and it it is less stress if you have just extra cash on the side and you're like i don't really care right but if you're if your job as an investor is to accumulate wealth. Well, we know that these cycles come in, come out, right? And we know that there are in in inevitable crashes and we see that there's a recession on the horizon. So I'm gonna ask everybody here listening, if you've been in this crypto space for quite some time, did you sell as much as you wanted to sell? Or do you think that maybe at some point you should have sold a little more because now we're in this bear market, we're below a trillion dollars. And we know that there's a lot of great buying opportunities right now and coming up in the next 12, 18, and 24 months. Maybe, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is wrong or right, maybe it would be nice to have the dry powder and cash on the side to go on, okay, first of all, I can breathe. And second of all, if these opportunities come up, I am ready to strike because I have enough in the background and I can do the things I want to do. So that, I think that, that's the bigger question you have to think about. And hopefully when people are listening to this now, maybe in a bull run, they think to themselves, wow, maybe it's a good idea to think about selling uh, at some point, maybe a percentage. Absolutely. Uh, Rob, you were talking, uh, yeah, you were talking about this, I guess the importance of the importance of just sometimes, sometimes just taking profits, you know, kind of moving on from this, this idea of kind of diamond handing until quite possibly the end of time. Uh, this, you know, this, this sense that you shouldn't be afraid to book a profit. You shouldn't be afraid to take some money off the table. As you, as you so correctly said, no one went broke taking profits. So yeah, I, I thought, um, yeah, what's, what sort of, um, what, what kind of advice can you, can you give people on that? You know, especially, especially given your kind of your long experience. Well, the first experience is this, is that it's, it's important to take profits along the way perfect, you know, at some point, I should say. So I know people will say, well, when do I take profits? When's a good, when's a good time to take profits? And this all depends on uh, really what it comes down to is what kind of, you know, trader uh, that you actually are. And, and if you are, you know, what's your time horizon? So there's, there's different types of traders and there's, there's technical analysis traders and they're all over YouTube. You can find uh, much better ones than me. I'm actually quite awful at TA. But you've got uh, TA, you got uh, FA, you got fundamental analysis uh, where people take a look at, well, you know, like, uh, what does the product do? And I always say, like, like, what's the cut? What's the community? How big is that? What is the utility? What does it do? What is the team behind it? What is the tokenomics? Uh, or, uh, and, and if you're into stocks, of course, you, you, you take a look at earnings, like what Warren Buffett does. And you take a look at sentiment analysis, uh, like what is the, and f the, the greed and fear index? Uh, what kind of sentiment is positive or negative and kind of go from all those things. But the big thing though, I think is, is time horizon. What kind of trader? Are you a scalper? Meaning like you sit around for like seconds and then just start trading all day long or a day trader where you can get things done in like uh, hours to, to days, a swing position uh, or a swing or again, days to weeks, a position trader months. Or if you're somebody like me who waits like uh, in, as far as like cycles, I, I kind of oscillate between a position and a cycle where I wait like weeks to months, sometimes even years, 
uh, to, to trade out because you have to understand it all depends on what you want to do. Do you want to sit around and, and, and look at a bunch of charts all day and just kind of get in and out? You can do that. It's just not my thing. I just got more things going on. Or if you just say, okay, here's, here's a basic way you can do it. And this is not financial advice. This is just the basics of basics, I would say. Let's say you put in $1,000 into Bitcoin and Bitcoin is at 20,000. And then it goes up to 40,000. Now that $1,000 is now worth $2,000. Maybe, maybe uh, you take out $1,100 from that position and go, okay, I'm gonna take profits, which is my initial investment plus hundred bucks and I'll have the $900 ride. And I don't really care what happens. That is just, that, that is just one thing that, that, that you can do. Or like for me, I take a look at, there's a couple different things I, I, I look at because this is only specific to crypto and digital assets. Stocks and the way that that market moves is different. It's not so much of a speculative asset. There's some actual you know, real world things that are going on as far as like an Apple, a Microsoft, a Tesla and their shares. But remember, it's speculative. So when I take a look at things, you have to understand that usually, not all the time, but Bitcoin moves first. Bitcoin starts to rally, altcoins rally behind that. People sell their, their position in Bitcoin a little bit to go into alts because there is, it's higher risk, but there's higher return. They ride those, those uh, positions up until they decide, okay, I'm gonna take my profits here. They get out of alts, alts fall, Bitcoins fall, and it kind of just goes again. So for me, what I take a look at is, and we did a video on this a couple weeks ago, which is, there's a great website. It's called lookintobitcoin.com. It's great because it's free, 100% free. It's got high quality um, uh, charts that you can take a look at. And the first thing I'm gonna look at is, uh, there's this thing called Pi Cycle Top. And the Pi Cycle Top, what it does is it takes the 111 day moving average as it crosses over the 350 day moving average times two. I know it sounds complex, but it makes it super simple because I like pictures because I'm not that smart. And I just like how the, how, how the colors are. <laughs> the colors are what will tell you like, look, uh, up here is in the red, meaning it's, it's pretty much gonna, it's, it's heating up. Maybe it's a good time to take some profits or it goes down to the green. Uh, uh, in, and that means that or it's cooling off in the blue section, I should say, where it's cooling off and maybe it's time to accumulate there. And there's a big wide swath. And what's crazy about the Pi Cycle Top, for example, it was created in 2019. It took a retrospective look back and it called the tops in 2013. It called the top almost perfectly in 2017. And in 2021, it called one of the tops when Bitcoin was at 60K you know, on April 11th, 2021, it missed the next top, which was in November, 2021, when it went from 60 to 68 K. But here's the thing for me, when I look at these things, I'm like, I don't, I'm never going to hit the top. I'm not that smart. I'm not that good. But if I get between 60 and 80% of the tops and I can buy between 60 and 80% of the bottoms, I hit those, those numbers overall, I'll be a much happier person. So we took a look at the pie cycle top. There's another one called the MVRVZ score. And that'll just take a look at um, the market value versus the realized value because things get overheated. This, and, it, and what I do is I take a look at these charts and just to kind of verify. They're not all going to line up. I take a look at that, that, uh, the NUPL, and um, what was the other one? Not stock to flow. Bitcoin mm -hmm. rainbow price chart indicator? Not really. Oh, the, and, and of course, there's one called the Puell multiple, which is pretty important. P U L E L L. Because what it does, it looks at the supply side of Bitcoin's economy, all the different uh, uh, Bitcoin miners. Because when they start to sell off, then it might be a good idea for you to start to sell off. And when they're holding pretty high, maybe it's a good idea for, uh, for you to do the same thing. So you take a look at all those, those four or five charts, run them together and go, this is where I think things are going. And then, what's, and then just to give Ben a plug from uh, into the cryptoverse, that only takes a look at Bitcoin. But what about the alts? Because if you take a look at, the, at one of the highs for Bitcoin, April 11th, Ethereum was only at $2,000. Cardano was only at $1.20, $1.30. Uh, Chainlink was, was far, far below that. Litecoin was actually pretty close. So again, if it starts with Bitcoin and then it goes into the altcoins, what do I do? Well, you can take those same charts that are in look into Bitcoin, go over to Ben's website, into the cryptoverse.com, and you can do a pie cycle top for Ethereum. You can do a pie cycle top for Chainlink, Cardano, Avalanche, all those things, and just go, oh, well, this is where things are going. 
you won't time the top, but it's a good idea to take a look at that as things go up and go, this is the, this is the, the profits I'm going to take. Again, nobody ever went broke taking profits. You might cry a little bit because you're like, oh, I took it at 60,000, but Bitcoin went to 69,000 and missed 9,000. It's okay. You're going to be all right. As long as you don't do what I did, which in 2017, write it all up and then all the way back down and be a bag holder for two or three years. There's a, I think there's there's a real sense. It's, it's it's interesting, you know, what you say about that 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 there's, you know, there's that 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 need that people feel to 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 try and to try and time the top perfectly. And as you say, like, hard, no one does it. It's it's almost impossible. And if anyone does do it, it it's m more often than not luck. But I think trading yeah. and investing there tends to there tends to be a kind of macho element to it. Sometimes I feel that that says, oh, you know, you and again. And this ties into this ties into the 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 concept of diamond hands doesn't it it's like you you somehow have to be a hard man about it you have to be you have to be tough as nails it's like no you have to be you have to be smart you have to get out it's like i remember someone saying uh, the best way the best way to to win a fight you know the best way to survive a fight is to not get into a fight in the first place yeah and it always kind of it always kind of stuck with me like that. It's like, yeah, you know, the the the, the people who do the people who do well are the people who cross the street and, and avoid trouble. You know, the people who take profits early and and accept that they cannot time the top. Yeah, and then I mean, you got to remember something is that there's always going to be the the person on the YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram is like, I timed I I timed it. I told you I timed it. Look at this tweet from blah blah blah. However, look at all the tweets, look at all the posts, because it's amazing how many people will say, this is the top. And then the month later, okay, this is the top. Okay, two months later, okay, this is the top. See, I told you, I got the top. And it, it's the same thing of like the doomsday predictors, right? Well, I, I, actually, if you even take a look, look back, like uh, some people say, you know, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get in a car accident. Okay, it's gonna be a car accident. It's gonna be a car accident. I mean, and, and they say that to you for like five years, and then you get in a car accident. You'll see. I told you. I told you you're gonna get in a car accident. Well, yes, of course. But you just gotta think. Did you really tell me the exact date? No, you didn't. And that's really what it comes down to. But people love to say, "I did it. I did this whole thing." Maybe I don't know. I'm just trying to be safe. Yeah, and I, I think uh, you know, in in the internet age, in the social media age, we so many you know we, we're assumed to have just really short memories and attention spans, aren't we? It's like oh, you know, mm. we'll only look at the last tweet, we'll only look at, we'll only watch the last video, and that's what so many of these kind of hype merchants count on, isn't it? It's like oh, oh they'll forget the fact that I that I said <laughs> BTC was going to go to two million, you know, just you know a couple of weeks ago or a few <laughs> months ago or anything like that. But they'll just look at the latest tweet and I'll see if I can get it right there. And if I don't, I'll just move on, you know. And I think. Um, it get, it kind of ties into that whole idea, doesn't it? Of if in doubt, zoom out. You know, you have to have you have to have a yeah. longer view. You can't just. It, it's so difficult. To, it's it's not worth trying to make decisions in the moment. You have to you have to use all the data that you can that you can find and the data that you can interpret interpret well. And I mean, the benefit is the upside is that that data is there. It's taking the time to to wade through it and and look at it and and try and make I think, you know, dispassionate decisions if you like. Yeah, and that's why. Well, that's why you got such a great channel guy because like you will do you you will do a deep dive into a project and then you'll follow up with the project and you say, did I do this right? And then you look at it and go, okay, we missed this part. We got this part. Here's the pros and cons. I actually stole that from you on my uh, on my channel for the pros and cons which makes sense and then you constantly update so people can go oh okay because a lot of times you'll see a a project or a prediction and no one really updates it and says and all you got to do is just go you know i messed that up that that wasn't right and i here's here's the correction and we go from there that's it yeah but it's it's hard to say that it is, but you know, it's so it's so important, and and you know, it's it's a thing that you've got to you got to accept, and it's it's a thing that it's a good thing for me to accept as well. And sometimes it does feel now, you know, you go, do you know what I was I was wrong about that, or I overstated I, I overstated this positive, or I understated this negative, but I think it reinforces in the viewer, or at least I hope it does, you know, this sense that this is a constant learning curve. You know, I feel. 
I feel like I know a lot about crypto, but I, you know, I, I like to think that I'm the first to admit that there's always more I can know. You know, it's a constant, a constant process. You can never know it all. And yeah. uh, is it um, was it Aristotle who who said you know it, that the first step on the road to wisdom is admitting how little it is that you actually know. I may be I may be getting my, my philosophers mixed up there, but that's some you know, that's something that I try to live by. It's it's like I there is always something for me to learn. And it's you know, it's it's about going out there and, and finding it and being open to it. Yeah. And that's why like in these in in this is the time for people in the crypto market that everything is in a bear market, that the noise, the volume gets turned down. So you can do a lot of good education for yourself to figure out what's the best investment strategy, what's the best project, what's the best plan of attack moving forward. Because right now is, is probably the most sanest you'll be when things are boring and moving sideways. And if you can make a plan now when things are, when like, I said, like I said, the volume is down, if you follow that plan when things get crazy, because it's going to get crazy, everybody, you're going to see these markets rip at some point and go, you know what? I know I'm up 500%, but I think it's going to go a thousand percent. And I think it's going to go 2000%. And that may be true, but you did a plan before and you're going to be a lot happier following that plan in the most sanest moments than when it gets insane. And those days are coming. Before we, uh, I, I want to talk in a minute, Rob, uh, about the, we were touching on this just before the break, and I, I want to get back to that in a moment. This idea, you know, we're starting to kind of lean in, I think, to the idea that sometimes, you, you know, when you want to do something, doing nothing is perhaps the best strategy. But before we get to that, I, I just want mm -hmm. as well to kind of go back to what you were you, you were talking about with with trading. And and you, I must say, uh, you know, you are, you, you have got such a, a, a um, a broader perspective on on trading than I have, you know, trading for me has I've, you know, one of the great things I think one of the great steps I kind of made in in the last in the last couple of years is kind of admitting that I am not really a trader, you know, I, I, I'm good at kind of digging into projects and looking at the big picture, and, you know, making what I think are informed decisions about buying and selling. But just this idea of trading, I think, is you know, especially especially on short time frames uh, or shorter time frames, is just is just beyond me. It's just not my not my strength. So, yeah, I think I think it's really important for people to to accept their their limitations as traders. Don't you think? I think yeah. I mean, but it's it's hard to accept the limitations when you see. And it's a constant bombardment of people saying how successful they are, whether they are or not. I, 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 can't, I can't speak for anybody. But when you take a look at it and go, like I, you, you alluded to this uh, just a little bit ago. Like, why can't I make those millions of dollars when I see this other person who's talking about it and he or she is making millions of dollars? It only makes sense that I could. First of all, I think you have to understand that, that some of those people are not truthfully honest about where it is. And the second thing is, is that you have to understand that sometimes those people that say that they made that on trading, they didn't make it on trading. They did a lot of things. They did, lot, they did some dirty things, whether that be a pump and dump or some other type of business, you don't know. So when they, when they flash something out here, you have to understand maybe that's not the real truth. And I know it's hard. It's, it's easy to say, and we're like, well, that makes sense. But then when you see it, you're like, hey, hey, that guy's got it. Why can't I get it? So just accept the fact that, again, like you're going to make mistakes and things aren't going to work out. You're never going to sell the absolute top. You're never going to sell the absolute bottom. But the real question is, what is most important for you and your specific situation? Is it to, to, to gain 10% on uh, whatever that you're invested into on top of your regular salary, or are you all the way up to like a micro strategy going, well, do we make uh, a couple of billion in, in this quarter or whatever else it is, hundreds of millions of dollars. And there's a big wide swath in between. So just say to yourself, what is important for me and what I want to do? Because there's a big difference out there. And and what I and I guess as well, and this is something that I think crypto has kind of muddied the waters on a bit because we have seen people who have made insane gains. You know, people who have invested perhaps just a, a couple of hundred dollars, or sometimes even less, and have become millionaires, multi-millionaires off the back of it. You know, and I, I think that's that's a, a thing that a, a sense that kind of still hangs around the crypto market. It's like this is 
this is a this is a way to make fast and easy money. And I think I mean I think for one thing, those days are well certainly they're 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 gone at the moment. <laughs> at the um, moment, yeah. At the moment, yeah, they could you know they could come back. They, they those sorts of returns aren't aren't impossible in the future. But I think it's so important to to manage expectations. And it's like you know it's not about making a million dollars off of a hundred you know that is that is the that is a moonshot and not many people pull it off but if you can make a thousand dollars off that hundred or even if you can make two hundred dollars off that one hundred dollars yeah. that is that is that is success that is success by by any sane person's measure yeah and then like I mean, the average returns of the of the of a typical of the S and P five hundred, you're looking at around eight point seven percent annualized, which is still pretty good, but not too bad. Now, years ago, you do a sixty forty split with uh, with, with stocks and, and bonds. That's a little bit out the window now, but I want everybody to remember this also is that you know you you'll see the post of and here's a prime example, like the Dogecoin millionaire seems like a nice guy, uh, and uh, I've you know li- li- I've watch the uh, the evolution of what happened there. So apparently he invested $180,000 $180, into Dogecoin when it was pennies on the dollar, right? And it went all the way up to uh, a million in three months, a million dollars worth. So he almost 10X, a little bit less than 10X. And then went all the way up to $3 million. And can you do that? Well, it's very risky if you have 180, and that's just like 180,000. I don't know who's got that laying around, but sure. And it goes all the way up to 3 million. But, and that's what people know, but they don't know this part. And that is that he never sold a dime. And he, f- and it went all the way back down as of three months ago, it was worth 320,000. That was three months ago. No, four months ago. And now today, it's probably around $210,000. So what we just talked about as far as taking profits, make sure you understand what's going on. And uh, you might see this one post of one guy who made a million dollars, but the question is, <laughs> Where is he now? And that is a bigger thing to think about. Yeah. And it's, I guess, you know, social media in particular is so, is so 2D, isn't it? You only get, you only get what's, what the, what the person is willing to show you. And Ah, as you alluded to earlier, you know, there's so much, there's so much happening behind the scenes in, in so many cases, but all we get is, is 2D on the screen. Whereas, you know, you, your own, your own perspective on, on your situation, that's in, that's in 3D. And that is a much, is a much clearer picture. So I think, yeah, it's really, as you say, it's really important to, to try and think, well, there's a, what's happening in that, what's happening in that other dimension that I'm not seeing, Mm -hmm. you know, is this, is this the full story? Because yeah, you know, that story uh, illustrates it perfectly, doesn't it? And, And I think, as you yeah as you said like this guy invested i mean who has 180 grand to invest in a dog coin i mean that's that risky is, yeah yeah i mean 18 dollars knock yourself out <laughs> <laughs> like, you go for it but 100 i mean that's just that's just mind-boggling i mean and you have to assume you you, you kind of have to just guess that that the, the person doing that $180,000 of them presumably isn't that much and therefore they are not they are not living a regular person's life by any stretch of the imagination. No, and you know that's that's more of a of, of a great story to highlight as opposed to the person who's like, you know, I've been investing for 20 years. I just put a little money into it and uh, as time goes on I take a little profits and uh, now I have X, Y, and Z. That's a very boring story. And no one wants to really get, that's not hype. That's not going to sell. That's not going to click. But that's, to me, is, is one of those ways to, to, to grow wealth over time. Not financial advice, but it seems to work out okay over time. Yeah. Don't be afraid to be boring. That's right. Don't be afraid to be boring. <laughs> Um, so a, a, a lesson I've I've taken to heart all my life, apparently. Um, but um, yeah, and and that kind of leads us in nicely, doesn't it, to what what we were touching on earlier? This idea of of just learning to do nothing. I think you know, oh. I, and I think this is a is this is a great time, you know, in, from an investment point of view. I think. I mean, I am. I look at the markets, and I think. I, this is this is just a time to sit on the sidelines. This is a time to, as you said earlier, you know, to to do to do some digging, to do the research, to do the, you know, to do the stuff that is going to stand you in good stead later on. But 
so many people ask me, you know, all the time at the moment, it's like, oh, what are you getting into at the moment? Anything you've got your eye on? It's like, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm holding back. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, there's, the, there's that, uh, I, when I look at all the, when people say, what are you getting into? What are you getting into? What's going on? You know, what's the next investment? It's like that, uh, that, that Dave Chappelle skit where, where there's a homeless guy. He's always scratching himself. Hey man, got any of that? Da, da, da. Cause it seems like it's almost like, like an addiction. It's there's three, there, there's three things and, and there's, and there's variability for investing. The easiest by far is to buy. It's easy to buy. It's, it's always easy to, for, for me to say dollar cost average or people to say buy the dip. It's the easiest way because you think I'm buying, I'm doing something, I'm taking action. The second hardest thing to do is selling. You're still taking action, but it's hard to, to, to say to yourself, well, this could have, like you said, it went up 500%, but it could go up 10,000%. But I did a plan, I got to sell. And the third and the by far the hardest thing to do is what you just said, guy, is sitting on your hands and waiting and doing nothing because you're not taking action. You're sitting in the sidelines going, and it's patience. And, and in this day and age when we are sucked into uh, the social media and the phones and, and, and the near instantaneous, instantaneous gratification, it's very hard to just sit and do nothing. And that, I think, right now is one of those things to do. And uh, unfortunately, I'm like, I, I say don't do anything. Am I talking about this on the channel? As far as dollar cost averaging, like for me, and I don't know that that's what it, what comes down to that that whole thing we talk about. Where is the money going? You know, we we have less than a trillion market cap and all these different trillions of dollars. We have Druck and Miller going to ten year time frame. I don't know who's right. So for me, I've scaled back drastically by dollar cost average, and I do very few altcoins, but I still buy a little bit and nibble along the way. But I still think that there's a lower low coming in. Uh, I don't know if it's this year or if it's next year, if we take a look at the, at the macro landscape. I mean, rates are going up. We still have uh, uh, the Ukraine war. You got the, the, the horrible situation with, with energy and energy supply in the UK, uh, the, the high cost of living, the housing market that uh, we're seeing more as far as supply and less of demand. And that's, that means that uh, there's, there's problems of brew. So when I look at this thing, I'm like, I can't buy much, but I just... Because maybe I'm wrong, and I nibble just a little bit. I think, and it, it, yeah, it's that 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 word control. I think that word. You know, you feel you feel in control if you're doing something, and that makes it, you know, it makes it so much harder, doesn't it? And I mean, my dad always uh, talks about because he's kind of amazed that. I mean, he's amazed that you can trade crypto twenty four seven. Yeah. For instance, because he, you know, when he was when he was kind of getting into investing many, many years ago, you know, you couldn't, you know, markets closed, you know, the market closed at at 3 p.m. or 5 p.m. Yeah. or whenever it was. And that was it. And it was closed over the weekend. If you, you know, and if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to invest in stocks, you had to call your broker and all this sort of stuff. And now he looks, you've got 24 hour, 24 seven crypto markets, you know, 365 days a year. You've got these platforms, you know, the, 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 things like Robin Hood and stuff where you can just buy it in your pocket and it feels like you know he was he was looking at one and he's just like it looks kind of like a game but it's it's it feels like it's rigged to try and make us do something to try and make us act all the time to be taking action and again this is a kind of it's a macho thing isn't it you know you know you're 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 a man of action you're doing something yeah. you're taking steps and actually again it's like be, don't be afraid to, to, to not take steps, to, to be a man of, a man of inaction. To, to do nothing. You know, when you just said that, it made me think about gambling. Because, you know, in, in the old days, of course, I mean, before the internet, this is, I'm an old guy, I remember this these days. Before the internet, I mean, to gamble, you had to go to certain states in the, in, in the U.S., one of those, of course, being uh, Las Vegas or even on the East Coast. And then, of course, then you could start to gamble online. And, of course, now that they're moving into it, more states are allowed to do that. But it's almost the same thing like what you just said. You know, there's these apps that you can go to and they take a lot of our time. And it's almost like, if you really think about it, in, in, these, in these spaces, we're really gambling. And, it's, and there's not much difference between gambling here and gambling in Las Vegas and putting all your, all your money on 18 black. And uh, so to get away from that is, a, is pretty hard to do. And I can see why yeah. people get into it. Yeah, it's and I, I remember sort of one of the most pervasive things in the UK 
uh, that I've noticed in recent years. I don't know if you have it over there, Rob, but, mm. um, you know, gambling has evolved now that you know, you used to bet on the outcome of of a, of a football match. Say that's a, that's that's I think the best example. Football. I mean, football is in, you know, um, so soccer. soccer. Yeah. <laughs> soccer. <laughs> um, but yeah, you used to bet on the outcome of a football match. Is it going to be win, lose or draw? And now it's evolved. Obviously, the Internet has enabled this, but you can people will bet on the number of free kicks, on the number of red cards, what time the next goal is going to be scored, how many corner kicks. You know, it, I, there, there, there seems to be no end mm -hmm. of things that you can bet on. And apparently I talk to people who. You know, I talk to people of my father's generation who who would go to football matches. I'm 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 not a big kind of uh, football match um, f a football fan, but you know, I, yeah. these guys would go, and you know, everyone would kind of watch the game. You'd be you'd be fixated on the game happening in front of you. And now, apparently, the stands are full of younger guys who are half watching the game, and half watching their phone and betting on what they're seeing and. The, you know, these older guys, these kind of veterans are just are just like, what has what? happened? This is crazy. Yeah, and that's, and that's the world we live in now. Who ever would have thought that the new drug, it wouldn't be some, some synthetic or fentanyl or, or crack. It would be right here. It would be in our hand 24-7, 365, yeah. and it would be socially acceptable. That's yeah. the crazy thing. And, and with adverts on TV and, you know, it's encouraged, it's, it's on billboards everywhere, you know, you know, smoking is bad now, but, but gambling, you know, it just hasn't, it hasn't caught up. It's, uh, it, it's so out of sync and mm. yeah, it's, it's a, it's a crazy, it's a crazy, crazy time. And that new drug is, is, is dopamine, isn't it? You know, yeah. they figured out, they figured out how to, how to make, make people's bodies release dopamine and got us all hooked on it. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the great, it's the great con of the 21st century, you could argue. Yeah, this uh, is the great. Yeah. No, 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 go ahead. No, no, that was, yeah, that was, no. yeah. And this is, my, my two this is why I, I get out every so often and, and do those, you know, we did this uh, uh, charity obstacle course for kids, and I get to go out there and work outside, do construction, things like that. And uh, that's my dopamine detox, do it twice a year, and it works out great. Because if not, unfortunately, Twitter will always be beckoning me saying, Read this tweet, tweet this yeah. out, check this out. Yeah. And then of course, here we go again. You sure it isn't time to post? You haven't posted in a while. What, what's happening? <laughs> are you, are you, are you, haven't you got anything to say? <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, man, it's bad uh, news. It, yeah, yeah. And but, I mean, that um, what you say about the, you know, going out and going out and uh, doing these obstacle courses for kids, you know, getting out in the fresh air, that leads me to the kind of the last thing that I wanted to the thing that I wanted to kind of sign off on, Rob, hmm. was this idea. And this is something I've talked about before as well. But market conditions are really tough at the moment. All those things you were talking about, all those potential hmm. black swans lurking out there, you know, the world feels a pretty dangerous mad and insecure place right now but yeah i think i think again it's so important is it not to 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 realize that there's nothing you can do about that and that you have to you know your responsibility as as an investor as as a person is to is to try and not let this stuff get on top of you yeah i mean if you look at the news and you look at what's going on it's a pretty bleak time frame but what can we control so we take a look and say and i always say this to myself uh give me the power to understand the things that i can control and not control and the knowledge to distinguish between the two and if i can understand that then i can say okay i can deal with this because this is a thing that it's within my realm of control i can't do anything for ukraine i can't uh you know go over there and, and, and conduct peace talks I can't deal with uh, uh, the Nord Stream sabotage and the uh, rising uh, electricity costs. I can't deal with what's going on in the crypto market as it plummets or it goes sideways or it goes up. I can't uh, control that. However, I can have a plan of action to things that I can control and just kind of go from there. And if, I can, if I'm okay with that, then, then I can kind of, uh, it, it leads to a little bit more mental health and I don't have to deal with so many things. So yeah. That, but that's the big thing. What can you control? What can you not control? 
I can't control a lot of things. It's just a little small sphere I have. Only Elon Musk can control things, apparently. Only Elon Musk can uh, can broker peace in Ukraine, apparently, according to him. But yeah, um, and, and 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 with a tweet, that's what's crazy. This guy's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I think that that just sums up what a what a crazy world we're living in at the moment, isn't it? Where Elon Musk is kind of positioning himself as a kind of diplomat statesman sort of guy. It's yeah, folks, you you can't control that sort of world, so don't even try. Don't even try. Exactly. Rob, this has been a real pleasure. It's always it's always great talking to you. You have such good advice. You have so much wisdom. And it's yeah, I, I, I love I love just kind of spending time chatting about all all things crypto and beyond with you. It really is uh, an absolute pleasure to have you on. So thank you so much for joining us today. Guy, it's always a pleasure. And we got to get together soon. I don't know when the next event is, but uh, well, we'll be there. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. And folks, for all you listening, um, yeah, Rob's everything Rob said uh, should have spoken for itself today. He is uh, a wonderful, a wonderful person to have in your life. So please do follow him. Uh, check out his YouTube channel, Digital Asset News, uh, youtube.com forward slash digital asset news. Uh, Rob, you're um, you're a great tweeter as well at News Asset. Uh, so follow Rob on Twitter too, and uh, he's got an excellent website too. Uh, Dan uh, Dan Teaches Crypto dot com, Digital Asset News. Dan Teaches Crypto dot com. Um, uh, Rob, do uh, do I need to give any other shout outs? Are you any other platforms I need to let people know about? No, Anywhere just know else that they can follow you. Just know that the website it's the it's the best information I can put together that I've uh, accumulated throughout the years, and it's one hundred percent free. It's free right now. It'll it'll be free tomorrow. It's always free, so just go there and check it out, and then share it with your friends. They can learn. That's the whole point of that. I don't. I just felt like if I charge, uh, there's people around the world that can't afford it. So just come by and uh, check it out for free. Sometimes the best things in life are free, folks. Yeah, do check that out. It's a wonderful website. Rob, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Guy. I'll see ya. See ya.